Welcome to the History Guy Podcast, a podcast dedicated to stories of lesser-known historical events told by Lance Geiger, also known as the History Guy on YouTube. I'm Josh, your host, a writer for the channel and eldest son of the History Guy. We tell all kinds of stories about history, from the modern era to the ancient past, so you never know what we're going to talk about next. One thing you can be sure of, it is history that deserves to be remembered. We at the History Guy are also excited to announce a new way to interact with the team and the History Guy himself at Locals.com. Join the History Guy Guild for your one-stop location to chat with other history fans, get updates on the team, and more. You can join for free or pay as little as $5 a month to get access to live chats with the History Guy, looks behind the scenes, early access to ad-free videos, and more. Find us at thehistoryguyguild.locals.com. We look forward to seeing you there. On today's episode, the History Guy talks about hurricanes. First, he tells the story of the Great Miami Hurricane and the circumstances that led that 1926 storm to being so deadly. Then he tells the story of Hurricane Hunter, James Doc McFadden, and the decades of work he did to better understand and prepare for hurricanes. Without further ado, let me introduce the History Guy. You know, I'm not a big sports guy, but if you've ever paid attention to collegiate football, you've probably heard of the University of Miami, which is a private research institution in Coral Gables, Florida, whose football program is so storied and successful that they are tied for fourth for the most Associated Press National Poll championships. And one of the things that's unique about the University of Miami is their unique nickname, the Miami Hurricanes. And of course, that's apropos, because Florida is, of course, a hot spot for hurricanes. But you might not have known that the University of Miami Hurricanes are named after a specific hurricane, one that nearly sank the university. At the time, the National Weather Bureau described the cyclone that hit Miami between September 17th and 20th, 1926, as probably the most destructive storm in the history of the United States. The Great Miami Hurricane of 1926, otherwise known as the Big Blow, deserves to be remembered. In the 1920s, Florida was overtaken by a wave of speculation called the Florida Land Boom. The combination of the economic prosperity of the 1920s and Miami's reputation as a tropical paradise drove both speculation and a wave of construction that made Miami the fastest growing city in the United States. In his 1936 book, Miami Millions, author Kenneth Ballinger wrote, the most spectacular real estate boom of modern times was getting ready to sprinkle its heedless millions over the state of Florida in 1924. The coast, where pirates under Morgan and Lafitte once plied their evil trades, spouted such riches that in one place, Oceanside developers actually abandoned a pirate treasure chest that they could feel with their dredges to get on with the more remunerative work of building a subdivision to sell. Apparently, those Florida developers were unaware that all good stories involve pirates. The excitement of the time was encapsulated in a 1924 jazz picture film starring Betty Compson as a girl whose only thought was the mad pursuit of pleasure and thrills and the conquest of the other sex. The boom was so spectacular that Ballinger says that in October 1924 it was not unusual for people with as little as a thousand dollars invested in a proposition to sell their option for sixty thousand dollars. The land boom drove an enormous amount of construction. In 1924, more than $17 million in new construction was started in Miami. The population of Miami more than doubled between 1920 and 1926. One of the places where construction was booming was the city of Coral Gables, a planned community southwest of Miami established in 1925. That building boom included the University of Miami, an institution founded largely on the land boom, as the university website explains. The University of Miami was chartered in 1925 by a group of citizens who felt an institution of higher learning was needed for the development of their young and growing community. The South Florida land boom was at its peak. Resources appeared ample, optimism flowed, and expectations were high. But what appeared to be a boom was actually a bubble, a bubble that Ballinger notes had hit its peak in November of 1925. The real estate climate was already cooling by the time the University of Miami prepared to hold its first classes in the fall of 1926. The South Florida Sun Sentinel wrote in 1993, It had not been a good year for South Florida. A wild real estate boom had collapsed. Millionaires at the end of 1925 had become poor folks by the middle of 1926. Solid citizens skipped monthly payments and tax bills and lost their homes. Businesses failed. The sun still shone, but its rays bounced off the bleaching skeletons of unfinished buildings. Where had the good times of the Roaring Twenties gone? Oh well, thought battered Floridans, 
things couldn't get worse. Hurricanes in South Florida were, of course, nothing new. According to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the first recorded hurricane in South Florida sank two Spanish ships in 1523. NOAA lists 159 known hurricanes that struck Florida before 1900, with storms in 1692 and 1781 killing more than a thousand people each. The damage was so significant in South Florida in the first part of the 20th century that author John Veeley wrote in his 1996 book, The Florida Keys, A History of the Pioneers, that it spelled the end of the Florida pineapple industry. But the boom had resulted in an important legacy. As the website of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration notes, Miami swelled with new residents, optimistic, speculative, and woefully undereducated about hurricanes. Thus, despite the area's long history with cyclones, Florida, after the land boom, was woefully unprepared when a hurricane was bearing down in September of 1926. The South Florida Sun Sentinel explains, There was no sense of alarm. Most of the 200,000 people living in the storm's projected path were new to Florida, lured here by the easy money of the land boom. Having never seen a hurricane, they had little knowledge of a storm's destructive force. It would cost many of them their lives. As the Public Broadcasting Services program The American Experience noted, the last major hurricane had hit Florida in 1910, when the population of Miami Beach could be counted on one, maybe two hands. On September 15, 1926, the National Weather Bureau issued warnings of three large tropical storms building in the Caribbean. The warnings fell not on deaf, but uncomprehending ears. The NOAA webpage says of the storm, The Great Miami Hurricane of 1926 was of classic Cape Verde origin, first known to the Weather Bureau from ship reports in the central tropical Atlantic on September 11th. But then the storm took a track that left the nation's Weather Bureau in the dark. NOAA continues, it passed north of the Leeward Islands of Puerto Rico on the 14th, 15th, and 16th, avoiding normal channels of Caribbean information. In those days before satellite pictures and reconnaissance aircraft, the hurricane remained somewhat of a mystery, with only a few ship reports to tell of its existence. There was, therefore, little warning. The NOAA webpage continues, As late as the morning of September 17th, less than 24 hours before the Category 4 storm's effects would begin in South Florida, no warnings had been issued. At noon, the Miami Weather Bureau office was authorized to post a storm warning one step below hurricane with winds of 48 to 55 knots. It was only as the barometer began to precipitously fall around 11 p.m. the night of September 17th that the Miami Bureau hoisted hurricane warnings. Even then, the Sun Sentinel notes, in 1926 there were few avenues for warning people. Only a handful of people owned radios to hear the warnings broadcast on South Florida's only radio station. The monthly meteorological notes of the National Weather Bureau read, The hurricane came with great suddenness. Except for a moderate but steady fall of the barometer after 10 a.m. on the 17th, there were no unusual meteorological conditions to herald the approach of the storm. At the time, there was no standardized system for naming tropical storms like we have today. No system would be standardized until around 1951. Residents who survived the storm simply called it the Big Blow. A writer from the United Press said of the storm, no one was expecting anything of the proportions of what happened. I have never experienced anything like it, and I hope I never will again. The wind shook, tore, wrenched the buildings. To venture into it was unthinkable. To breathe flew through the air. At times there was a roar accompanying the storm that was deafening. It was difficult to breathe. If people screamed for help, probably no one could hear them. Another anonymous account from an employee of the Sinclair Refining Company that was published in the South Florida History Magazine in 1989 talks about people seeking refuge in a downtown Miami hotel. The hotel had filled with refugees, many of them having lost everything they owned except what they had on them in their lives. We went around the lobby trying to figure out how many languages were being used in prayers. Counted Hungarian, Polish, Swedish, Irish, English, and profane. At the Weather Bureau downtown, it was difficult to provide accurate measurement as the equipment kept being swept away by the storm. Richard Gray, head of the office, wrote in the monthly weather review, The top of the rain gauge blew off at 3.42 a.m. and was recovered and replaced by Mr. C.B. Mosley, Jr., the assistant at this station. It was again blown off a few minutes later and lost. Part of it was found the next day on the roof of a nearby building. The instrument shelter blew away between 4 a.m. and 5 a.m., landing in the street below and crashing into the automobile of Mr. Arthur Peavy, a Miami Daily News staff writer who was on duty at the Weather Bureau office. Then, remarkably, the storm subsided quickly. Gray wrote that there was an abrupt decrease in wind velocity between 6.10 and 6.15 a.m. The damage was substantial. A letter reported in the South Florida History Magazine said, All signs and awnings were down and most of the shop windows open. You could help yourself to anything in them, and some were doing that. 
but the area was at the point of its greatest danger, and the inexperienced population didn't understand hurricanes. The storm hadn't passed. In fact, Miami was at its very center, in the deceptively calm eye of the storm. Gray wrote, Many people who had spent the night in downtown buildings rushed out to view the wreckage that filled the streets. I warned those in the vicinity of the federal building that the storm was not over and that it would be dangerous to remain in the open. But few heard the warning. The NOAA webpage explains, The eye of the hurricane, with its period of relative calm, passed over downtown Miami and parts of Coconut Grove and South Miami around 6.30 a.m. on September 18th. Residents of the city, unfamiliar with hurricanes, thought the storm was over and emerged from their places of refuge out into the city streets. People even began returning to the mainland from Miami Beach. People had come out from cover. Cars began crossing the bridge from hard-hit Miami Beach, thinking it was finally safe to leave. But the worst part was yet to come. Some of the news reports at the time talked about a second storm, not realizing that they were seeing the same storm. Gray wrote, The low lasted 35 minutes, and during this time the streets of the city became crowded with people. As a result, many lives were lost during the second phase of the storm. Moreover, what Gray had described as the second phase of the storm as the relative lull of the eye passed was more destructive than the first. Another anonymous witness from a letter published in the magazine South Beach USA wrote, The fiercest and most inescapable of all elemental disturbances, the West Indian hurricane that destroyed the jewel-like resort communities, roared out of the sea and wrought its dreadful havoc under a canopy of storm clouds. Then, when terrified thousands thought its fury spent and were about to begin the work of counting its toll, it circled and struck again with redoubled intensity, completing the devastation of its first blow and leaving vaster ruin in its wake. Gray wrote in the typically dry language of the monthly weather report, The distribution of the wreckage indicated more damage was done during the second phase than during the first phase of the storm. The NOAA webpage expounds, the worst part of the hurricane, with onshore southeasterly winds bringing a 10-foot storm surge onto Miami Beach and the barrier islands, began around 7 a.m. and continued the rest of the morning. At the height of the storm surge, the water from the Atlantic extended all the way across Miami Beach and Biscayne Bay into the city of Miami for several city blocks. PBS's American Experience described the damage. Structural damage was stupefying. Utility poles hurtled through the air. Roofs were torn from buildings. Electricity and water were cut off. Even the beach seemed to shift. Collins Avenue was covered in sand, as were lobbies of prestigious oceanfront hotels. The sand even swallowed some of the cars trying to escape Miami Beach during the lull. Gray noted, One automobile dug from the sand several days after the storm contained the bodies of a man, his wife, and two children. The anonymous Sinclair employee wrote, Never saw such destruction in all my young life. Practically every house was damaged in some way. Porches gone, roofs gone, windows and awnings gone, and some absolutely demolished. They're still finding bodies in them, often looking for them because of the odor coming from them. The webpage of the U.S. Army Installation Management Command for the Southeast Region notes that every building in the downtown district of Miami was damaged or destroyed. The town of Moorhaven on the south side of Lake Okeechobee was completely flooded by lake surge from the hurricane. Hundreds of people in Moorhaven alone were killed by the surge, with less behind floodwaters in the town for weeks afterward. The extent of the surge was evident from the boats, some of them massive, that lay in the city streets. The Boston Globe reported scores of tugs, freighters, yachts, pleasure boats, and dredges were dashed against the wharves at Miami and sunk or lifted by the tidal wave and deposited 50 yards or more inland upon Biscayne Boulevard. Altogether, there are less than a half dozen vessels of all kinds left on the waterfront. On September 21st, the Brooklyn Daily Eagle of Brooklyn, New York, quoted Harold W. Cole, manager of public relations for Florida East Coast Railway. War can be no more terrible than the devastation wrought. Miami is smashed. Coral Gables is badly wrecked. Hollywood is badly hurt, while Fort Lauderdale, Dania, and Pompano are virtually leveled. For those four hours, it was terrible beyond description. Our windows crashed in. Falling tiles from surrounding homes crashed against our house. And afterwards, we saw that these, blown by the wind with incredible velocity, made gashes in the house that an axe could not have made. For a few lines, Mr. Gray at the Weather Bureau abandoned the dispassionate reporting of the weather gauges to describe the terror of an Atlantic hurricane. The intensity of the storm and the wreckage it left cannot adequately be described. The continuous roar of the wind and the crash of the falling buildings, flying debris and plate glass, the shriek of fire apparatus and ambulances that rendered assistance until the streets became impassable, the terrifically driven rain that came in sheets as dense as fog, the electrical flashes from live wires had left the memory of a fearful night in the minds of the many thousands that were in the storm area. 
Without power and communication to the outside, local resources were overwhelmed. The letter reported in South Beach, USA said, so complete was the ruin wrought in Miami and its sister communities that nearly 24 hours elapsed before the first word of the disaster reached the outside world. The stricken cities began their own feeble attempts at checking the toll and writing the damage before the rest of the world even knew of their loss. The Boston Globe wrote, business in these cities and towns does not exist. Banks and stores are closed. Most of them, if not completely destroyed, are mere hulks. Thousands of great plate glass windows were smashed like eggshells by the force of the hurricane. A few restaurants were able to serve meals in Miami Saturday afternoon, but the available supply of meat, bread, and other food was soon exhausted. Relief came from all over the nation as President Calvin Coolidge made a national appeal for donations to the Red Cross and dispatched the Army and Coast Guard to assist in the relief efforts. The extent of the storm was significant at the time it was considered to be the worst natural disaster to strike the United States since the 1906 San Francisco earthquake and fire. Today it's considered to be the 12th strongest and 12th deadliest storm to have struck the United States in the 20th century. The Red Cross officially listed 372 dead, although many more might have been unaccounted for, and as many as 800 were listed as missing. Property damage was large, as much as $1.65 billion in adjusted dollars. But perhaps most notable is the estimate, given the growth in population, construction, and property values, that if the same storm hit today, the damage would be on the order of $157 billion, which would make it the most expensive Atlantic hurricane in history. The University of Miami, which had been built on the optimism of the Florida land boom, started its first classes just a couple of weeks after the storm. But the storm had washed away all that optimism, and the university spent its first 15 years struggling financially on the verge of bankruptcy, nearly sunk by the great hurricane. The football program that is so storied today had to delay their very first game for a month because of the storm. They played the game on October 23rd. They beat nearby Rollins College by a score of 7 to nothing. And by the end of 1926, they had settled on their nickname, the Hurricanes. It was the timing of the storm that had the biggest economic impact. It put a final end to the Florida land boom. Investors walked away. People who had invested lost their fortunes. And Florida sank into the Great Depression three years ahead of the rest of the country. The York Times of York, Pennsylvania summed it up very well in their headline. Playground of the nation transformed into scene of desolation. But it was perhaps a young woman who was part of a couple that apparently lost everything that ran into that anonymous Sinclair employee who summed it up best. The employee said she tried not to cry. She leaned her head on her husband's shoulder and she said, I wish we had never seen Miami. Now is the part of the episode where we get to chat with the history guy. A little bit about what we just heard, what we're going to hear, and some behind the scenes stuff you only get to hear about on the podcast. After this episode, of course, one of the things we're seeing this this past week is another hurricane, and this one's Hurricane Ian that's hitting uh, hit Florida and is at least while we're recording this is hitting the Carolinas. And so I think I think one of the first things we want to say is that you know our our thoughts are with the many people who are struggling and recovering from this from this hurricane. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It uh, I mean, it, there's a lot when we discuss this. There's a lot's going to be kind of instructive about it because of course there are two hurricanes that hit Florida, uh, but it. Uh, you, you'll be able to contrast kind of what what's changed since 1926 and what hasn't. And, you know, yeah. we, you know it's still we, we still don't know how to you still can't stop the fury of the storm and it's still going to come and do damage. And, and if anything, actually more damage because we built more stuff where storms go. Yeah, it's I mean, it's one of those things with I, we, I think we learned that in history a lot is that uh, no matter no matter how much we humans have done, uh, ultimately nature is nature's going to throw a wrench in it it is and yeah. there's not much we can do about it not much we can do about it and so it's uh, uh our our hearts and minds are with the people in florida right now and and uh, the, the people who've lost people and the people who've lost property uh and uh, but i mean that's all the more reason to talk about these hurricanes in history because it's all those are all lessons learned and and one of the lessons is that the, the people the victims of these storms deserve to be remembered and so it's a good time to talk about it absolutely and when we talk about this hurricane in particular it's it's interesting to some extent you know all of history we 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 impose narratives upon it <laughs> and we mm -hmm. and I mean that's one of the things that's what we do at the history guys specifically but uh, in some ways it's also just there's a lot going on there's always a lot going on and sometimes it comes together to create something like 
this great Miami hurricane, yeah. which was a particular tragedy. It is a I mean, series of circumstances. It has to do with the timing, the economic timing, uh, running into the yeah. Great Depression uh, at a you know a point where a bubble was bursting in Florida, but also at a point where you had a lot of people moving in who had no experience with it. I mean, all that added together. So it's, it wasn't. Uh, this storm was particularly destructive because of when it hit in human economics, and that's interesting to see how those two relate to each other. Yeah. And it's it's interesting because you don't necessarily go in thinking, uh, you know, the the Great Depression and the Miami building boom that all this stuff was going to specifically have such a such an integral part of the story yeah. of this this hurricane. And this yet it does. Hurricane, yeah. It, yeah. As as you tell the story, there's so this would have been a very different story if it hit ten years before, or ten years after, or ten years after. Uh, yeah. Yeah, if it had been a different kind of, if it had been you know a different kind of storm, or if it hadn't been as powerful. Um, I, I think I think that I was I was just reading recently. It was it's possibly like the twelfth most powerful storm is where they they estimate. Yeah, I don't. I mean, because be. of course that moves because we get new storms. I don't know yeah. how that moves uh, just because we you know we just had Ian come through. But yes, it was at the time the twelfth most powerful storm when I made the video, which was a year ago. It was uh, the twelfth most powerful storm and the twelfth deadliest storm in American history. Is, yeah, which is. Which is uh, which is 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 something else, and it's it's interesting. I mean, you you know, you tell the story about how they they come out during the eye of the hurricane, mm -hmm. and that's I mean, that's really where you know the fact that these people didn't know what to expect. Yeah, they didn't uh, understand the weather guys outside yelling at them to get back inside. They think the storm's over. Uh, some people apparently tragic. try to drive across a causeway and then get ca got caught, and and yeah. So I mean, these are people who really didn't understand. One of the things that startles me about this this hurricane, the twenty six hurricane, is that uh, you know we had experienced Galveston was the that was the deadliest storm in American history, and this this is two and a half decades after the Galveston, more than two and a half decades after the Galveston storm, and um, people still didn't understand hurricanes and they didn't understand being you know the the whole idea which was what the, kind of one of the galveston is you know at least go inside sort of thing people still didn't understand how these storms worked and it, it's it's kind of stunning how slowly we learned uh yeah. not just how to find and predict hurricanes which is a which is a long and interesting story and it makes more and, you know we can talk about that more in the, in the other episode for today but also just in you know, how people regard the 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 power of the storm and how you know they're yeah. they're hubris before nature because they just didn't understand so uh i mean i you know this one ends where, where it ends really tells the story of it where she says i wish i'd never heard of miami because people moved there because they thought it was a paradise and then <laughs> storm comes yeah. and you know their their land is worthless anyway and it washed away the house that they built and, the, and you know now they're living on the second floor of the hotel trying to figure out how to get home uh, but uh it is it is interesting to me because it feels like there were lessons not learned before this hurricane that should have been learned before this hurricane yeah i mean there's edison film of the destruction in galveston how how by 1926 have we not figured things out but it also it just surprised one of the things that's surprising about it is when you see pictures of the harbor i mean do you really think about in 1926 that we're still quite there's still a lot of quite a lot of ship transport with sailing ships yeah uh, and there's quite a few of them in the harbor yeah that they're still using clipper ships as 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 you know transport uh, and uh, it's it's kind of it's kind of shocking where it kind of is in the in the 20th century, and it feels like it feels like it's kind of you know right at the at this you know gasp where it's I mean is this modern is it not modern I mean they're right on that edge of when things become modern so yeah right because they talk about mm -hmm. I mean they had they had cars and roads and uh, th uh, modern roads you know things that we would expect uh, we. Uh, we don't we don't really mention it, but uh, Miami Beach was built by someone else. We talked about uh, mm -hmm. Carl Carl Fisher, mm -hmm. and so he you know this was that was when he he was one of these big proponents of roads, uh, and had built highways across the United States. And so it was it was a place we were really modernizing. But mm -hmm. it's interesting because it's kind of that silent piece of American history that we it is yeah uh, that, that's sort of in between. It's the Art Deco yeah. era, and it's it's really it's really yeah. interesting. Yeah. So I mean, there was just a lot that was interesting about the storm, but the, its level of destruction, and especially the the I mean, I think they had some in the three hundreds of of lives lost for sure, but I mean, might have yeah. been many more. Uh, it might have been up to you know seven hundred more. It might have been a thousand loss, and uh, you know for people whose names they didn't even know. Uh, that I mean yeah. that's that's something that we've gotten much better at. There's much less life lost now, partly because we can just predict storms much better, but partly because people understand the power of these storms and they you know they leave. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, this 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 population didn't know what to do about the, I mean, this population went walking out in the middle of the storm, and and then you know the damage was worse on the other side of the eye wall than it was in the start. Yeah. And it's one of those I, I, when we talk about technology. Uh, you had mentioned there was there was one radio station, uh -huh. and people didn't people didn't necessarily have radios. Uh -huh. uh, and it's to, I mean today you know gosh you can 
uh, fire off a text to everyone in a you know in a particular area, mm -hmm. and you've got a pretty good chance of getting at yeah. Least virtually most everybody people. has a phone. Virtually everyone has a. I yeah. mean, it's, there's some there's some very spectacular changes in technology since, yeah. and there's there's reasons that we can. I mean, so our, our ability not just to predict a storm but to give warnings and give them effectively is certainly you know dramatically improved in the time since. Yeah. I mean, it's been Which, it's been nearly a century since the storm. So. Yeah, and that that might be another piece of uh, gosh, it's really close to a century, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, every every once in a while, I forget how far we are into the into the, the twenty first century. Um, it's you the storm kind of specifically kind of snuck up, yeah, on Florida. Yeah. They didn't. They didn't. I, we kind of we knew it was forming. We had some idea of it, but then when it actually hit, it had managed to just not. Not make contact yeah, I mean, there, with the number of ships. There are, I mean, you even see today. I mean, if you if you watched with with, with you know the the recent storm with Ian, they, you know they they you know there's multiple paths it can take, and they never really know. So I mean, at the period, the way that you knew where a storm was going is you were getting radio reports from ships at sea, and you know we we know uh, you know how much a hurricane can move even in an era when we're you know satellite tracking and flying planes into them and all that yeah. sort of stuff. So yeah, it wasn't uh, they didn't really know how that was going to hit where it hit. And, and yeah, uh, until and pretty much until it did. Yeah, until and it that's did, yeah. uh, and we had. I mean, you can see the somewhere some of the changes from Galveston. We had started trying to really mm -hmm. prepare for these things. I mean, Galveston had no had no warning at all. Yeah. It, it was essentially just the storm. The storm came, <laughs> and that. Uh, but this yeah. was. Well, I mean, you know, they had a little bit of that because one of the top experts on hurricanes in the world was there in Galveston. Yeah. But he had argued they didn't need a seawall, but uh, he at least put up the warning earlier than uh, if he hadn't yeah. been there, then, then they would have. Uh, but yeah, you know, so but I mean, it's I, it, to me it feels what's startling to me is how little we had really gained in terms of understanding these storms yeah. twenty six years later after the disaster at Galveston, and, and you know, certainly, it's always, I, I think of I, I guess I think when you look at it, I feel that nineteen twenty six was was less modern than I kind of thought nineteen twenty six was. But you know, not everybody yeah. had a phone, not everybody had a radio, not everybody had a car, uh, and uh, and the, the 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 difference was you know not as uh, the difference between. The 1900 hurricane and the 1926 hurricane was not as much as I thought it might be over that period. Yeah, I think we had learned quite a bit, and I mean we did, and maybe it wasn't. Uh, one of those one of those difficulties is you know going from what we learned to uh, using that to actually make changes, mm -hmm. and certainly it seems that the broader public uh, did not did not, <laughs> did not but learn. It, but it came because outside of the outside economics. Of it came the, at a time when the infrastructure yeah. and the population were uniquely unprepared yeah. for a major storm. They, they had half built buildings and stuff like that, which yeah, I can't absolutely. imagine was, are going to stand it, up. It to... was it was overbuilt uh, and it was being built in a hurry. Uh, and uh, the, there was a lot of construction that wasn't completed. Uh, and I mean, there were a number of reasons where the economics made this of the time made the storm worse. And then, of course, it's after impact too economically, because they were already yeah. a bubble that was bursting. I mean, it really did kind of start the the Great Depression. I mean, so it was the, it occurred a couple of years ahead of the Great Depression. But that really was where it, it kind of kicked off. It lit the fuse there was was the crash in Miami. And this, yeah. you know, so much accelerated that crash. It's uh, it really is. It's just an incredible. And you see the pictures and the mm -hmm. hear the stories of how, you know, the sand moved so quickly mm -hmm. uh, it was that it buried people. And I, I it's it's frightening. And I, I think that, you know, th these days we I think I think even people I mean, I've never lived near where there was a hurricane. And uh, I still I still think that, you know, we've we've done a pretty good job these days that even people who don't deal with hurricanes have a pretty good idea of what that destruction is. But also, yeah. you know, we're able to uh, continually tell people, this is how you'll deal with it. We will, this is how we'll be able to get. And as it has, you know, as it gets closer, they, we may ev ev evacuate people and stuff. We've got systems. Yeah. And a lot of that is stuff that, um, uh, you wonder if maybe we should have figured out some more of that by the time we got to this hurricane. Yeah. Well, you know, we think Galveston would have taught a lot, but I mean, we learned a lot from the 26 hurricane too. That was one of the big differences, though, is that Galveston we have we actually have some video of it from Edison, which is which is extraordinary yeah. because it's, it's so early. But uh, yeah, the the extent to which this one, uh, the, the 26 hurricane, was really the first hurricane to hit the U.S. that was really photography uh, uh, photographically documented very very well. Uh, and I think that's startling, and that's that's one of the things that you, if you want to talk about, because there were plenty of hurricanes that came before this too. But you know, you're yeah. you're working from you know, you know, from people's descriptions as opposed to being able to actually see the photographs of the damage. Uh, and it's it's the the photographs of the damage after the hurricane are absolutely startling. I mean, uh, you know, ships, yeah. you know, ships a hundred yards inland or five hundred yards inland, you know, large ships and. Uh, and the, the destruction of the buildings and the, and the you know automobiles and things like that. It's uh, so it really is. I mean, it's uh, 
it's a tragedy, you know, uh, severe weather, severe weather. But I mean, it deserves to be remembered. And it, one of the reasons it deserves to be remembered is because lessons learned there still mean things when hurricanes are still hitting today. Yeah, absolutely. And this is the I mean, we still can learn stuff about it. I think we do. Uh, we certainly do better than we used to. And we'll we'll talk about some of the ways that that's changed in the next episode. Um, I you 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 kind of bracket this this the whole story of the Miami hurricane with the the sports mm -hmm. story about the the college team there. I I neither one of us have ever yeah. really been into collegiate sports. Where where did you where did you hear that story? Actually, you know, I learned of the hurricane first, uh, and and I was you know I, we, there's always lots of ways that we come up with topics for the history guys. So it was just kind of hurricane season, and I was looking up lesser known storms, and this one was certainly significant, but I didn't think a lot of people had remembered it. And it was in researching the hurricane I found out that the the Miami hurricanes were named after this specific hurricane, which I didn't know that before. I mean, I you know I'm not a big sport fan, but I certainly you know knew of the Miami hurricanes and. I, I just assumed that it was just a name that had to do with Florida. I didn't really realize that it was yeah. a specific hurricane. Uh, and, you know, that's just a, that's an interesting little piece of, you know, I guess that's kind of historical trivia. But, I mean, it's very important yeah. to a school that, you know, most people would recognize. Yeah, and it's a, it's a connection. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's one of it, those things that gets forgotten. It is, I mean, that's a sign, too. I mean, it is a really hopeful sign because uh, that the yeah. university survived and still thrives today. Uh, and that is, yeah. you know, that's one of the lessons of, of history is that we've lived through worse. Yeah. And we're, we will continue to rebuild. They've, every time a storm hits, I mean, we'll rebuild it and we'll hopefully Florida will rebuild even better. Yeah. There's people who've lost everything and, and, uh, yeah. and I, you know, we just, we, uh, we hope, and you know, that there's all sorts of ways that you can contribute. Uh, but I certainly, but I mean, yeah, I mean, the, the idea though is, I mean, we're not going to abandon Florida, you know, we're going to survive. If, yeah. if the university of Miami lived through this hurricane, uh, then we've pretty much decided that we're resilient enough to live through even these these mighty powerful storms. Uh, I've never myself. I've always lived in the uh, the Rocky Mountains, and I've never been traveling at a time where I saw really a anything uh, <laughs> similar to a, to a hurricane. But I did want to ask you: Have you ever have you ever been in a hurricane? No, no. I mean, I've been all over. I've been to Florida many times. And I've been along the, the the Atlantic coast many times, but I've never been in a hurricane or a typhoon. I was briefly. Uh, around like the edges of a tropical storm. It was amazing how much rain came down, but I've never been in, you know, where it felt that threat. Now I've been close to tornadoes because I grew up, grew up in America Midwest, uh, enough to see the funnels and stuff like that in the distance. But uh, no, I've never, and uh, uh, I've never tried living in, in paradise. And I, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's a part of me thinks that I would be that idiot that says, well, I'm going to write it out just to see what it's like. And, you know, part of me thinks like, I, you know, <laughs> two weeks, two weeks before I will already have moved. <laughs> So. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to stick around for this. But it it's, was, I mean, there I, are people there who are so, it was kind of interesting in the, in the last one there because there are people there who, yeah. you know, they, they, they've just built their house this way and they have the generator and they're, I mean, they, you know, that's just second nature to them. Uh, and I don't know if all of those came out okay, but, uh, uh, and, uh, but uh, no, I've not experienced the power of the storm, but I've certainly seen, <laughs> I've seen enough of it on TV. Uh, and uh, but yeah. you know that's that's one of the reasons why it's so fun to be the history guy is that you you can really feel the emotion of it when you do things like write and produce this episode. Absolutely, yeah, and it's and we're able to connect to these people. I mean, man, I'm I'm sure that there are families that uh, you know were there here in 1926, and they've got descendants who just faced Hurricane Ian. I mean, these are places. Yeah. These are people who. Uh, stuck through and are living in, you know, this is their home. Yeah, I mean, there's and plenty those, of families storms... in Florida who have lived through several hurricanes. You yeah, know? And, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's just part of, it's part of what you accept of life, you know, and choosing to live there. Magellan TV is sponsoring this episode, and they sponsor all of our podcasts. And if you've listened to the podcast, you know that what we like to do is talk about what we've been watching on Magellan TV lately. And so what have you been watching on Magellan TV? Uh, yeah, I was I was watching the series with Stephen Fry. It's called Last Chance to See, uh, and it's really kind of an interesting story. I mean, Stephen Fry is you know a very famous actor comedian uh, from the United Kingdom. He was good friends with Douglas Adams, who wrote the uh, Hitchhiker's, Hitchhiker's Guide's books. Douglas Adams passed away, I think, in two thousand one. But uh, back in the nineties, Douglas Adams uh, became uh, very interested in uh, environmentalism, and he'd done a, a series where he went in search of a number of very uh, you know endangered species. And so 20 years later, and after his death, Stephen Fry was his good friend. 
Uh, as a matter of fact, said he stayed in his house while he was doing that. Uh, Stephen Fry was wow. his good friend, and Stephen Fry is going to go out to see, you know, are these species still around to go revisit them. So it's uh, it's an older series. I mean, I think it came out like 2009. It was a BBC series. And one of the cool things, there's a lot of cool things about Magellan, but there's a lot of brand new documentaries on Magellan, but there's also a lot of really great classic documentaries on Magellan. Uh, it, Stephen Fry is clearly not, you know, the sort of guy who usually goes on safari. Uh, and so it's part of it. Part of it's almost travel log. I mean, you can identify because that's exactly how I'd be stumbling through the Amazon or Africa. And actually, I, I don't want to spoil it, but in the first episode, he does he manages to injure himself, you know, while he's in the Amazon. So I mean, part of it's kind of travel log. Part of it's his sense of humor. Uh, but it's also this labor of love because it, it's it's in memory of his friend. Uh, and it's true, you know, yeah. environmentalism is you go to see rare species and try to see what's happening to these rare species. Magellan is so much fun because you can just turn on whatever you see. There's just so many things that you can pick from. It's delightful and enjoyable to watch uh, because it's people who are really actually having a good time, but also doing, you know, good things. And, you know, that's I love yeah. Magellan. You can watch history. You can watch nature. You can watch science. You can watch crime. You know, every kind of documentary under the sun, it's it's on Magellan TV. What have you been watching lately? What I was watching most recently and what I want to talk about is it's called Kurdistan, the untold story of Mesopotamia. When we think about the, the Fertile Crescent, the, the beginning of civilization. Well, apparently we had done a lot of that uh, archaeology early in the years, um, mostly in places like uh, Syria and Jordan and southern Iraq. But the northern part of Iraq, Iraqi Kurdistan, largely we did not do a lot of archaeology there. And so we, we had a relatively small amount of information about this section, but they were recently able to, to have more exploration there. And one of the things they talk about is that in the 90s, uh, there were spy satellites that had ex essentially taken pictures of that area because we were watching where uh, the USSR was putting military stuff. It was not particularly useful in, uh, information for the government. Apparently, it was great archaeological information because we had really, really high definition photos of lands that had not been able to be uh, explored archaeologically. And so what they're this is about a numer numerous people who are going into this area and finding, I mean, a lot of new stuff, talking about, you know, Assyrian, great Assyrian cities and stuff, and finding that this was kind of historically we had thought it was fairly hinterland. And it turns out that there was actually quite a bit of uh, there was there was some heavy population density. It's some really, really, really cool stuff. And so if you you know if you like learning about these ancient societies in the in the near the Middle East and that what kind of they talk about this being one of the most uh, site rich uh, locations in in the Middle East, which is saying something because gosh, Hardly seems like can kick a rock without finding a, a ruin there. Uh, but it was it was really cool what kind of stuff they find out and what kind of research they're able to do and how they are trying to preserve this information, uh, especially in a region that has still had a lot of conflict and where this stuff kind of stuff is being destroyed by various uh, most most recently by you know the Islamic State is destroying some of this stuff and how we can maybe reconstruct or remember and at least learn something from this stuff that we before it's gone. Fascinating. Yeah, I love archaeology, and I'll have to check that one out. Gotta love Magellan TV. And of course, if you are a listener or watcher of The History Guy, you can always go to try.magellantv.com slash historyguy, where we will always have a deal for you, sometimes a free month or a deal on an annual membership, or even a documentary that you can watch for free. Again, that's try.magellantv.com slash historyguy. Next up, the History Guy tells the story of James Doc McFadden and his incredible life. And stay tuned after the episode to chat a little more with the History Guy. Using some fancy calculations, the website How It Works determined that an average hurricane releases energy equivalent to about 200 times the total amount of energy that can be produced by all the world's power plants combined in a single day. The website notes that NASA estimates that over a hurricane's life cycle, it might release energy equivalent to some 10,000 atomic bombs. Deliberately flying an airplane into that energy might seem crazy. Deliberately flying an airplane into that energy for the purpose of research, to better understand and therefore help save people from nature's wrath, might be considered heroic. Doing that nearly 600 times in a career spanning more than five decades might make you one of the greatest unsung heroes of the modern age. James Doc McFadden's name is not well known outside of certain research circles, but it should be. 
Although largely unknown in popular memory, he was a central figure at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Aircraft Operations Center. And his work has saved countless lives as part of NOAA's mission to better understand weather phenomena and better predict its behavior. It is history that deserves to be remembered. James McFadden was born in Winchester, Virginia in 1934. He was one of four children and had a twin brother. He earned a degree in geology at Virginia Tech and took a reserve commission in the Army after graduation, becoming a teacher and operations officer at Fort Bliss in the Anti-Aircraft Guided Missile School in El Paso, Texas. He later said that geology wasn't his first choice, but after giving chemical engineering a go, he realized, well, that wasn't going to work. He studied geochemistry for a time before joining the then new program for meteorology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 1960. There he got a PhD in meteorology and a minor in oceanography. At Madison he studied climate in a research assistantship with the US Navy, especially concerning climate in the Soviet Union. It was there that he fell in love with airplanes. As part of the research involving studying lakes in Canada from the air to compare it to information that they had on lakes in the Soviet Union. He then worked with the Weather Bureau in Washington, D.C., studying sea-air interaction, which involved work with planes and the study of hurricanes. He was working there when the Weather Bureau, the U.S. Coast and Geodetic Survey, and parts of the National Bureau of Standards were merged into a single scientific agency with the Department of Commerce, the Environmental Science and Services Administration. Working with the Ocean Research Group, a laboratory was established in Florida, and McFadden was invited to join the Aircraft Group, which provided aircraft for scientific study, but didn't have many scientists involved in their organization. They said they wanted someone who understands the science, who can translate what scientists want into what we can provide. He would later state that he stayed with the Aircraft Group because it provided everything that he liked. Aircraft, meteorology, and travel. Of all the work that Dr. McFadden did and the many projects that he was a part of, by far the one he is best known for is becoming one of the hurricane hunters. The United States had been flying planes into hurricanes for scientific study since 1943, when reconnaissance aircraft first flew deliberately into a Category 2 surprise hurricane which landed in Texas. The research flight facility was founded in 1961. Dr. McFadden joined in 1968. The first planes the facility had were two Douglas DC-6, a B-57A, and a DC-4. Some of the earliest research was into whether dynamic cloud seeding could be used to decrease the intensity of hurricanes. Dr. McFadden's first flight into a hurricane actually came before he even joined the flight group in 1966. He was in a research plane studying upwelling when the plane received a call that the research flight meant to go into the hurricane couldn't make it, so his plane broke off from its own research to fly through the hurricane. He said that the first hurricane, Hurricane Inez, was underwhelming, but later said that every hurricane is different. Don't let the first one you fly in fool you, because you'll get your comeuppance later. It was with the Miami flight group that he became more interested in hurricanes, and he became a flight meteorologist and began flying often into hurricanes, as much as a thousand hours of hurricane flying in a season. In 1970, the ESSA was abolished, and the program was reorganized into the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. The ESSA Corps became the NOAA Commissioned Officer Corps, one of the eight uniformed services of the United States. McFadden stayed with the Aircraft Operations Center for the rest of his career, flying into hundreds of hurricanes over nearly 53 years of active service. During that career he saw, as meteorologist and co-founder of the Weather Underground website Dr. Jeff Masters put it, perhaps the most incredible diversity of weather phenomena of any person in history. Known as Doc, McFadden would often regale his colleagues and others with tales of the incredible things he saw throughout his long career. A full 360-degree rainbow, a full moon shining through the eye of a Category 4 hurricane, and spectacular sunsets. Despite flying into literally hundreds of hurricanes, complete with wind speeds of 150 miles per hour or more, he didn't consider the job particularly dangerous. It's not inherently dangerous. Sure, guys get paid a paltry hazard fee for flying hurricanes, but the planes are certainly up to it, and the crew is more than capable. So I would never be afraid to get on an airplane into a hurricane. I just wouldn't. Still, Dr. McFadden was a part of two close calls during his career. In 1989, he was aboard a plane that flew into Hurricane Hugo, showing a reporter from Barbados what they did during a mission. They flew into the hurricane at 1,500 feet and had misjudged what they thought was a Category 2 or 3 hurricane and turned out to be in a rapidly intensifying Category 5. They lost an engine in the storm's eyewall and nearly punched into the sea, but the pilot was able to steady the plane and get them home. I say I have nine lives, McFadden said. And that was one of my nine lives. 
He was also aboard a plane in 2007, doing work with the Ocean Winds Project, chasing a hurricane-strength winter storm in the Atlantic. The storm was remarkable and threw sea spray up 3,000 feet to where the plane was flying. Three engines failed in rapid succession, and the plane fell steadily towards the ocean in weather so cold and the sea so harsh it was unlikely they would survive. Like a miracle, they tried to restart the engines, and each one came back online. They were able to land safely. Initially, the research flight facility operated out of the Miami International Airport and flew missions around the world researching all kinds of atmospheric phenomena and weather. They did monsoon projects in India, thunderstorm projects in the western United States, along with studies of winter storms, projects in West Africa, and of course hurricanes in the Caribbean. McFadden said that in many ways, flying in hurricanes in the 70s was similar to today, except that they were flying in older aircraft with much older technology. McFadden began flying in DC-6s, but by 1975 NOAA received the first of two specially designed and modified P-3 Orions, which became two of the primary hurricane hunting planes. In the mid-1980s, Dr. McFadden became the Chief of Programs and Projects at the Aircraft Operations Center. In that position, he oversaw and coordinated all research projects involving NOAA's aircraft. Several dozen aircraft of all kinds of makes and models, from helicopters to light aircraft to the heavier aircraft used in hurricane hunting. He was instrumental in how and where the planes were used, and the many hundreds of projects they have completed all around the globe. Regarding hurricanes, it's perhaps easy for us to forget how much has changed in our ability to predict hurricanes. In 1900, the Great Galveston Hurricane arrived with essentially no warning. The only fanfare was a long period swell from the east and unusual movements of clouds. Very nearly the same advice that Native Americans had given Columbus nearly 400 years earlier. That storm claimed as many as 8,000 lives and caused enormous property damage. Until 1943, the only reports that could get close to the coast before the hurricane were telegraph and radio signals made by people who were able to physically observe the storm. 1943, when that first plane entered the surprise hurricane, proved that modern planes were more than sturdy enough to survive hurricane winds. In fact, commercial planes flying in the jet stream regularly fly through winds exceeding 150 miles per hour, but the real risk is sheer, the sudden change in horizontal or vertical winds that can destroy an aircraft, which today's planes can often identify on the radar and avoid. Only a year later, the light loss of life in a New England hurricane was attributed to better forecasts. By the 1950s, hurricane hunters would track the storms and fix their centers by flying into the storm perpendicular to the wind until they reached the eye. This allowed them to measure the strength of the hurricane and later predict their behavior using statistical models. By 1960, satellites were first used to identify forming storms. Since then, technology has advanced rapidly with new instruments like step frequency microwave radiometers and drop sons. These advancements have massively changed the situation. They prevent 90% of expected U.S. hurricane deaths if technology operated as they did in 1950. They used to say, and maybe they still say, it cost a million dollars a mile to prepare the coastline for a hurricane. Better tracking and forecasting can reduce this, in addition to saving lives. And since 1968, McFadden was at the center of those changes, keeping abreast of changing technologies, missions, and research. Dr. McFadden oversaw a system that has matured from hand-drawn charts with coastal residents receiving little to no warning of an impending storm, to modern forecast and forecast products that afford a very precise segment of coastal residents five to seven days advance notice, said Commander Chris Sloan, commanding officer of the Aircraft Operations Center. In 2016, it was reported that work of hurricane research has made the five-day forecast as accurate as the three-day forecast was just ten years earlier. It's difficult to overstate his influence on hurricane forecasting and data collection. There isn't a single person who's experienced a hurricane or a tropical cyclone who hasn't been directly impacted by his work in a positive way, said Carl Newman, Deputy Director of the AOC. Since the beginning, he was there, mentoring and shepherding generations of atmospheric scientists and hunters. Throughout his career, he was lauded for his phenomenal dedication to his work. As recently as 2016, he was described as an anchor who continues to reinvent, motivate, and drive the organization to continue to innovate and do better. Like many public servants, Doc McFadden's personal passion for his work has gone largely unreported, except in some very particular circles and among the many people he has worked with. In 2016, he was recognized as a finalist for the Samuel J. Heyman Service to America medals, sometimes called the Oscars of Government Service. He was recognized by the Guinness Book of World Records as having the longest career as a hurricane hunter for his nearly 53 years of service. The center moved many times, from Miami to MacDill Air Force Base in Tampa to its current location in Lakeland, Florida, and through it all, Doc McFadden continued to fly. He made his last penetration into an eye wall in 2019, the age of 85, into Hurricane Jerry.
Over the years, he laughed off the very idea of retiring. Why would I retire? He said, I have the best life. While at the same time, of course, raising and taking care of his family and his four children. He did, however, say in an interview in 2020 for the 50th anniversary of Noah that he might finally retire before 2021. But life intervened. On September 28th, 2020, James Doc McFadden, the unsung hero whose work had saved so many lives and protected so much property, passed away after a brief illness, peacefully in his home in Coral Gables, Florida. In memoriam, Rear Admiral Michael Sala, director of the NOAA Office of Marine and Aviation Operations, said of him that his leadership, dedication, professionalism, and many contributions to airborne data collection and atmospheric research cannot be overstated. He will be greatly missed. So we, we first learned about uh, Dr. McFadden when we were contacted by members of the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration. Uh, their aircraft operations center and so this is located in florida and we we got to talk to them and i think we've been we've been really honored that we've been able to continue yeah, to work absolutely with them. yeah yeah, yeah so and, one of the fun things story. about doing what we do is that we get invited by all sorts of cool people things that we didn't yeah. expect i remember that first meeting because you know they these are guys who fly airplanes into hurricanes <laughs> so so josh and i are like whoa and then they were very impressed with the history guys so, i mean they, i think we were starstruck all around on that particular episode and we've done some great stuff with them it's always and yeah. you know they a lot of great history there that's absolutely worth talking about absolutely and, and a lot more i mean we'll we'll continue to work with them uh we just we were just seeing some some videos of the the hurricane hunters flying into uh flying into hurricane ian so this you know they're they're continuing to do this work this is something they've been doing for uh, well i guess we flew into the first hurricane in the in the 1940s as the that's what we mentioned that in this video that that mm -hmm. was the first time we'd flown into them and now now we do it regularly uh we yeah were, all the time an they, awful they lot. It and, and it means a lot yeah it's it's one of those things uh I knew we flew into hurricanes, but when you start looking at the history of it and that even in the 1940s, the planes were perfectly capable of yeah. flying through through those hurricanes. That, that did surprise me. It does. Well, I was, you, you see, I mean, because, you know, a hurricane force winds are 150 miles per hour. But if a plane's flying yeah. 150 miles per hour, it's getting hurricane force winds. So it's surprising. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, it's still got to be exciting. Uh, and uh, though yeah. they've they've never lost anyone, right? I think we say that in the no. Episode. I don't. Yeah. I think I think that we we talked about the two times here because, uh, well, Mc, Doc was so involved with the program that he was on board both times that they had their closest calls. That they had their closest calls and, that an engine go out or yeah, yeah, yeah. And he still, despite despite you know the uh, the interesting circumstances of both of those both of those events, uh, he never really thought it was that dangerous. He he was he was always he's just like I. I would never not go into a hurricane because I was afraid of it. Yeah. And I, I I think personally that there's some bravery in that. Well, actually, uh, <laughs> there's no question that they were doing very dangerous things and they were doing it for the benefit of humanity. Yeah. So, I mean, I, we've had arguments up and down and backwards and forwards over, you know, what her heroism is or if you're just doing your job. Yeah. But, I mean, he volunteered to put himself at risk repeatedly for the good of humanity. Yeah. And I think that's there's no question that that's heroic. Uh, and yeah. honestly, the biggest thing I got from this episode, because he had just, uh, you know, he had retired and then he passed away very quickly. Uh, and I think that was, this was shortly after that had happened. And I, I, after the episode, I just, I wish I'd gotten to meet him because he sounds yeah, like an absolutely thought... extraordinary guy. The videos of him, he seems just like he's, he's very affable and, and, uh, you know, and not self-assuming and stuff like that. And, and, uh, yeah. uh, it's, it, I mean, it sounds like he would have been a fascinating person to meet, but he seemed to really enjoy his job. And do it long after he would have had to have done it. Not long after My he, goodness, he, he could was, have been. In he was eighty five flying yeah. into hurricanes. Yeah, yeah. He, yeah. Didn't, he didn't have to keep flying into hurricanes. He did, and 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 it was apparently. I don't think it's some jollies that were flying into hurricanes. I think that he was truly uh, interested, loved the science, yeah. and and that he believed in the work. Yeah, absolutely extraordinary guy. Of course, and who had more experience at it than than he did. Yeah. I, I mean, honestly, he uh, he was recognized by the, the Guinness World Record book for having been the hurricane hunter, the longest uh, career of a hurricane hunter for 50, <laughs> 53 years. Who's going to break that so, record? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he well, I tell you what, it's uh, he was still absolutely happy and willing to to go into these to do the science, you know, when he's 85 and he's still interested in learning and what we can what we can figure out about hurricanes. And I mean, certainly throughout this episode, you know, we have people talk about uh, who he was and what kind of work he did and how important his work was. Mm -hmm. And it's it's clear that 
he was he was vital to what Absolutely, we learned yeah. and how He's, we understand. You, you really have to say this this man is one of the reasons that the, the loss of life is so much less today than it was in 1926 is because of Doc McFadden. Yeah. And it, you can't yeah. really count the number of lives that he probably saved because he so increased our understanding of how these storms work and where these storms are going to go and how you can prepare for these storms. And, and that's, that's, that's quite a legacy. I think when we released it, I think what we find out is that he was fairly well known down in, in Florida where, where he operated. Yeah. He was probably on the news quite a lot. But I think he was almost completely unknown throughout the rest of the country unless you were in, you know, yeah. into meteorology. Uh, and, and, uh, and so I, this is a story that really needed to be told because you have no idea uh, that your life might have been saved, that your property might have been saved, that your relative might have been saved, because this one, you know, quiet, unassuming scientist spent 50 yeah. years of his life better understanding these terrible events. And leading, uh, leading the Aircraft Operations Center. And it sounds, it certainly sounds like when we talked to the people and when we've, we've read about people who talked about him, you know, after he died and stuff, that he was, he was very interested in mentoring people and in continuing to pursue uh, this this kind of information, and you think his his impact will be felt uh, and continue to be felt for for years yeah, and years yeah. and years. I, I don't think uh, I don't think there's probably anybody there who wasn't their life wasn't touched by him and or who wasn't yeah. inspired by him. Uh, and it sounds like he was actually just a very good administrator too, really supported his division. Yeah. And I mean, it's so I mean, there's there's just uh, you know this is there's nothing negative to say. This is an amazing guy who did amazing things and never never asked for attention because of it, but at least no. deserves to have his name known. At least deserves to have people know what he did for, for them. So one of the things that we just learned recently, of course, he, he died before we made the video back in the September of 2020. However, fairly recently, just actually just earlier this month, I think he was, uh, he, a crew with, with the aircraft operations center conducted a, a burial at sea for him. And this would have been, they, they said it would, would have been his 600th, uh, penetration of a hurricane. I, I can't imagine that a hurricane hunter, could have a more fitting burial than to be buried buried at sea in a hurricane. That was his. I'm trying to remember. Was his 300th or his 600th? It, it's it, it's a coincidence that it was it hit right on a decimal uh, at that at, uh, in terms of his trips into a hurricane. And yeah, what an appropriate way for his remains. Uh, you know, uh, I'm sure that's absolutely what he asked, what his family wanted to do. And it's uh, you know we brought the video back up again when that happened because uh, it's. You know, it's another reason that we should remember him. But yeah, how how appropriate is it that, uh, that his remains were disposed of in a hurricane? You know, when we we talk when we talk about you know figures like this one that are that are quite unknown, I uh, I think there's a lot that we can learn from figures like this who seem to be kind of in the background. And it's not just about you know what an incredible people they are, but also about how how much even you know I, I mean clearly. He didn't do it necessarily completely alone. He had teams, oh, he absolutely. had planes, yeah, he had yeah. the whole uh, operation center. We're not trying to claim that, but also that there is, there are these stories of people who simply were going about their lives and doing the work that they were doing and have made enormous impacts that we don't see. And I think I mean, that I think there's that, a reason we talk about forgotten history on the history guy. I yeah. mean, that, you know, and that it's interesting. There's no real definition of forgotten history, but there's a reason that we talk about lesser known history, uh, because uh, you, when you go to school, there's only so many people you're going to talk about. There's only so many yeah. things that they can cover. Uh, and there are so many people that are so important all the time uh, and they deserve to be remembered. So that's it's a great his is a great story to tell. And it's someone that you know about. But it also suggests that there are other Doc McFadden's out there. That yeah. are changing lives every day, uh, and that we don't we don't know their names and we don't know what they've accomplished. And, and you know, people in their fields might know them, but the people yeah. in general who are impacted might not. And that's that's one of the great reasons to tell the stories. Yeah. And we uh, certainly we are never going to cover every single person who deserves to be remembered for the the work they've done. But I I, I mean I'm I am happy that we were able to to you know meet meet the folks at the aircraft operations center and to tell doc's story because i i do think that that he deserves to be remembered and that people absolutely i, yeah. I think that people learned about him from us and i think we also learned i mean there were people in the comments who did meet him or who heard him speak and were able to speak you know to to the way that he had touched people and i think that we uh, forget sometimes just how many people we might touch in our everyday lives uh, doing whatever it is we do, whether we're flying into hurricanes or doing something uh, somewhat less exciting. Uh, but I think that we all, you know, we point, all have yeah, part to play. I'm not sure if you if you listen to what people say about him. I'm not sure he thought he was important. 
Yeah. Uh, and so maybe part of the lesson here is that you, what you're doing might be more important than you realize. Uh, yeah. And uh, so that's, that's a good story too. I mean, all, 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 I mean, he's certainly someone that, you know, deserves to be known. His name deserves to be known, but that tells us all yeah. sorts of lessons about uh, people that we, that we maybe should appreciate more. And, you know, the person that you bump into at the store might be more than you realize or might've done more than you realize. And, uh, and yeah, it's, I mean, it's all, there's all great lessons to talk about these people who really had an impact uh, didn't make the news a lot, didn't hear about them a lot, yeah. uh, because uh, that, that tells you those are your friends, your neighbors, those, that's everybody. Uh, and that might be you even, and you don't even necessarily know. So yeah. that's, a good, that's a good point. Even if you, you don't think your work is all that important or you're not, uh, uh, you know, you don't think you're necessarily you know, saving lives the way Doc McFadden did. I think that Doc really saw his work as uh, something that needed to be done. Especially when you hear yeah. about it. I, I yeah. hope that so many of those people that said that he inspired me, he changed my life. I hope that many of them got the chance to tell him that. Uh, yeah. Before, because he's you know he's gone now. Uh, because he, yeah. I mean his his legacy, uh, even if even if his name is not well known, his legacy is very very strong. And so I guess that's a piece. That's that's lesson too. If you appreciate someone, if they inspired you, you know, yeah. go tell them. Appre appreciate you've only got them while you can. Yeah. yeah. While you can. And it's and I I think that he'll continue to inspire people. I hope that us telling his story helps to inspire people because I think he was a an inspiring individual. Absolutely. And you know we talk about so many people from the past and you know yeah I mean yeah he's he's so relatively recent, still history, mm -hmm. but I mean so relatively recent. I mean we're not we're not out of you know people that changed the world. We're not. No. Uh, it is still going on, uh, and uh, and there's there's reasons to realize. I and mean, one of the reasons to learn about the past is to understand the the, the present and the future. And one of the things to understand about that is these people that were great in the past and the people in the past didn't necessarily recognize that in their time. Yeah. Uh, and that we've got those, you know, everybody that you, you know, look at for inspiration in the past, there's, there's people today that are changing the world just as much. And uh, we might yeah. not realize that until we can look back in the, in the focus of history. That's it's, it's great to have a voice and that have people to listen to that voice. And so there'll be many yeah. more. There are a lot, there are a lot of more, you know, Doc McFadden's for us to talk yeah. about. Well, there, there are people, like we said, there are people flying into those hurricanes still today. Today? Uh, Risking their lives I mean, today. Yeah, I mean, there's probably yeah, people that flew literally today. Yeah. Literally today that are learning that are learning things about it. And I don't know, uh, there's, there's some kind of crazy, it sounds like sci-fi talk about what we might be able to do about hurricanes in the future, or even, you know, weather manipulation kind of stuff. And uh, there's going to be stories of people who yeah. are who are doing that work today that might, that, that yeah. will be history. Uh, that might be very, very incredible. Yeah, yeah. Who's, who, who knows? I mean, certainly we've gotten so much better at predicting, and I mean, but I mean, who knows yeah. what the future is going to be? And when we look back at it, you know, those people were doing it right now. So, yeah, yeah. Today's so we, today's history. Today's certainly history because something big like a, a hurricane is history. I mean, yeah, got, we're living through a lot of history right now. People ask me about that all the time, uh, and you really can't look back at it until you look back. You know, with the with the, yeah. the virtue of some time, and but uh, uh, you know, appreciate that uh, you're living through history too. Thank you for listening to this episode of the History Guy podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Forgotten History, and if you did, you can find more on our website, thehistoryguy.com. We release podcasts every two weeks, so stick around if you want to hear more podcasts of Forgotten History. You can also find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and Patreon. You can even get a personalized message from the History Guy himself on Cameo.